Good morning. Please stand with me and let's sing our opening hymn, Eternal Father, Strong to Save. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to have uh, all of you here and to be worshiping the Lord together. This is an exciting service, not just because it's Memorial Day, not just because it's Trinity Sunday in the church, but also we have a baptism, and we get to come together and hear the word of God. Uh, Amelia Jane Shula is going to be baptized after the sermon. And uh, Alex is going to be preaching um, about the covenant with the mediator into which all of us come through baptism. When we are baptized, when we come to the Lord, we come not to a mountain of fear, but to a mountain of grace through the mediator, Jesus Christ. Let's continue in worship together with the Collect for Purity. Together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given to us, your servants, grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal trinity in the power of your divine majesty to worship the unity. Keep us steadfast in this faith and worship and bring us at last to see you, to see in your one and eternal glory, O Father, who with the Son and the Holy Spirit live and reign, one God forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the lessons.
Good morning. This is a reading from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 through 29. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. Even if a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less we will escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At the time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. This is the word of the Lord. Our psalm this morning is a portion of Psalm 50. Let's read it responsively by half verse, beginning on page two of your bulletins. The Lord, even the most mighty God, has spoken. He called the world from the rising of the sun to the going down thereof. Out of Zion, perfect in her beauty, go forth in glory. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. The mighty tempest shall be stirred up round about. He shall be. He shall call the heavens above. Gather my faithful together unto me. Who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, and the heavens shall declare his righteousness. For God himself is judge. Please stand with me for the reading of the gospel. This is the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Barakiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation." The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. Thanks, Ben. Not flippy, floppy, gentle Jesus, meek and mild in the Gospel lesson at all. But our God is a consuming fire, yet he gives us grace. That's the theme this morning. Let's pray as we stand. Lord Jesus, we pray that through your grace we would behold exactly who you are and find ourselves even more in awe of who you are and yet at the same time more in awe of what you have done for us by bringing us in to your kingdom through your work on the cross. Amen. Amen. Let's take our seats. 
So uh, welcome to those of you visiting. Uh, you are arriving at the end of a five-month series on the book of Hebrews, and so the gist of the last five months uh, is that this book asks the central question, who is Jesus? That's the question on the front of the bulletin. And the answer is that Jesus is like absolutely everything they knew from the Old Testament, only bigger. So one of the most frequent observations about God in the Old Testament is that he is holy. And God is so holy that whenever he interacts with his people, he does so through someone else. There's often a mediator, like an angel or a prophet or a priest. Or he does so as something else. He manifests in some way that masks his full glory, like smoke or or light or fire or lightning. Uh, Or he does so from somewhere else. There are careful boundaries that mark out just how close you can get. And we are in the book of Hebrews, but first, let's all turn to Exodus chapter 19 for a clear example of this point. Exodus 19, you want it open in front of you as we look for these mediators and masks and markers. So when you find Exodus 19, uh, the Hebrew people, they've escaped from Egypt. They've crossed through the Red Sea. They've entered into the wilderness. And as Moses climbs Mount Sinai, God, masked in cloud as usual, instructs Moses, the mediator, as usual, Exodus 19, 12. You shall set limits, mark out a boundary. For the people all around saying, take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot. They could not even get close enough to touch the person who touched the bottom of, the edge of, the mountain of God, because you cannot bring your unholiness into the presence of a holy God and expect to live. For God to welcome even a tiny sin even a minuscule, microscopic sin into his presence, and then to allow its effects to rip through eternity, given infinite space and infinite time, would eventually be to turn heaven into hell. And he won't do that. So verse 23, he's a judge. Uh, That's the Hebrews passage. And verse 29, a consuming fire. And so God often advises people to stay away for their own safety. Of course, on most occasions, people don't need to be told to stay away. This is very much like my dog, Rugby, during yesterday's storm. Uh, Whenever lightning hits the church spire, which it does a lot because it's tall, uh, he knows what to do when the house lights up with a flash and there's a boom. Uh, Rugby runs, he shakes, and he hides under my toilet. And they didn't have toilets in those days, so they just stayed away. They just stayed as far away as they could. But it's the same principle, exactly the same principle. Exodus chapter 20, a verse for my dog. Now, when all the people saw the thunder, I don't think you can see thunder, but let's not get, you know, let's not quibble. And the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the mask, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off. They marked out their own boundary. And they said to Moses, the mediator, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. And what I find fascinating is the first thing Moses does when he comes down is he says in verse 20, do not be afraid. You don't need to be afraid of this. Very strange thing to say, but next, Moses institutes something that will transform the nature of their relationship with God just as was the case when they left Egypt. In verse 24, he tells them, build an altar and make on it a sacrifice for sin. And the sacrifice, a life in exchange for theirs, a life to pay for their sins, will atone. It will purify and enable them to draw near. Don't get too carried away, though. Uh, There will still be mediators, there will still be masks, there will still be markers of the boundary. And the the full manifestation of God, who he is, will still be somewhat distant, but they will be closer than they ever were before. And this becomes the pattern of the Old Testament. Through sacrificial death, 
substituted in their place, people are permitted increasingly to draw ever closer to God. So what about now? Let's turn to Hebrews. Hebrews 12 is written to us today. And speaking to us today in verse 18, Hebrews 12 says, uh, verse 18, For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. You have not come to the old experience of God like they had in Exodus 19 and 20. You have not come to God in that way. Verse 20, for they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But that was the old Mount Sinai experience. And you've not come to the old Sinai experience. You, verse 22, have come to Mount Zion. Even Amelia's come to Mount Zion. And, it, and it's a very different mountain for a very, very different meeting. Mount Zion, also in the Old Testament. This is the stronghold of Jerusalem. That's where the uh, image has gone now. The city, 2 Samuel 5, that David made his own. This is the place, Isaiah 62, of proximity to God. You've come to a much closer mountain. You've come to the kind of mountain where God is still revealed in all of his power, but it's also the kind of mountain that somehow you can hang around on in peace. This is, in fact, what Jerusalem means. Yeru or Yara. We're not quite sure which it is. It means to teach someone to aim or to see. Uh, in the way that people are transfixed on something when they're filled with awe. And shalom, peace. It's the way that people feel when they are settled and at one with God. Everyone gets to be close to God in Zion and no one gets stoned to death and no one has to hide under a toilet on that mountain. And so we see from this, don't we, that even before Jesus, long before Jesus, the people of God experienced a development in their relationship with God. From Egypt, where there was such great distance from God that generations believed he'd given up on them, to Sinai, where there was still great distance, but now they could see and hear some things that revealed him from far away, to Zion, where he made his permanent dwelling place right there amongst them. And yeah, there were still mediators and masks and markers in Zion, as we've seen. There were temples and priests and thick curtains and most holy places because he was still holy and they were still not. But they were far, far closer in Zion than they had ever been before. Now, as we move into the New Testament, firmly into the New Testament, about as firmly as you can get the end of it, uh, Zion uh, becomes an image of what we can expect. So the old earthly city of Zion, the old Zion city of Jerusalem becomes for us Christians an image of what we can expect at the end when Christ returns. In Revelation 21, John records, I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It becomes a vision of the end, a promise that one day a Zion-like experience will occur whereby we get to live in proximity with God, only this time completely one with him. We will live in a place like Zion, only perfect. Heaven itself will come down and overwhelm the earth with unmediated, unmasked, unmarked fullness of God forevermore. Now, at this point, you might say, cool, that makes sense, right? They were miles away in Egypt. They were, let's say, yards away at the foot of Mount Sinai. They were just feet away on Mount Zion. And a time is coming when we shall be perfectly on point, right in the very presence of God. We will arrive exactly where he is, or as Revelation says, he will arrive exactly where we are. And so I guess it's not going to take a Mensa genius to work out where we are right now, right? Miles away, yards away, feet away, dot, 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 right on point. Obviously, right now, we're just inches away. 
I guess. There's a clear pattern. Fill in the blank. That is good math. But it's poor theology. Because it's not where the author of Hebrews says we are right now. He does not say, you guys, you're so nearly there. Oh, you know, it's tantalizing. Look at verse 22. But you have come to the city of the living God. I think that means heaven. To the heavenly Jerusalem. Okay, it does mean heaven. And to innumerable angels in feastal gathering. If it is the city of angels, it's one of two things. It's either California or heaven. I think it's heaven. I rather think the other, uh, California might well be the other place, actually, as I think about it. <laughs> Verse 23, to the assembly, a lot of fire. Verse 23, into the assembly of the firstborn. Assembly, this tells us it's heaven. Uh, because you know what the most common title for God is in the Bible? It is Lord of hosts. The God of angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. Firstborn, well, that tells us it's heaven. Because where is the firstborn? Jesus, right now enthroned in heaven, who are enrolled, that is to say registered or entitled as belonging in heaven, you can underline it, to the God of the judge of all. If you've come to the judgment seat, you have come to heaven, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Where are all the righteous people right now? Where are the perfect people? Heaven. If it says heaven eight different ways, why waste the ink? Well, it's not a waste, is it? The Bible never wastes ink. It's one of their most precious commodities. It's deliberate to say it eight different ways. Deliberate, I think, because the idea is so controversial that it needs to be said over and over and over again until we can no longer just interpret things away and say, ah, well, it don't really mean heaven. And by the way, the controversy is not the idea that God is in heaven. It's that we are. Verse 22. You have come to, past tense, already. You have arrived in heaven, times eight. Now, what's the problem with this idea? Right, obviously, if this is heaven and we have arrived, let's hope that they have a good complaints department, because I could think of a few improvements (laughs) to this situation that we're in. If this is the ultimate state of being, if this is the end state of reality, the ultimate Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the thing we've been waiting for since the creation of the world, we should be exceedingly disappointed. We live with far too many manifold woes for this to be our ultimate hope. This week, the Hughes family minivan broke down on the side of the road. Does Hebrews 12 suggest that Jenna has to drive that around for eternity? Uh, Last week, my lawnmower blew up. It's also a Honda, just note. Uh, The Conrad shattered. It blew a hole in the side of the cylinder housing, and uh, oil burst all over the ground, so I bought a new one, and that one blew up after one lap of my yard. Also a Honda. Does anybody know when the world's first lawnmower was made? 1830, and it still runs. Now the lifespan of a $1,000 machine is measured in minutes. And so I Googled it, because I was pretty annoyed, and apparently this is, quote, a known fault. And I want to say that theologically speaking, they all are, aren't they? Nothing lasts. Our broken things, like they've got a line of broken things in my garage, I can't even get my car in at the moment, preaches to me that our current state could not possibly be our eternal one. In 1549, Cranmer called this a naughty world, uh, meaning uh, it was full of things that come to naught. Nout, nothing, nada, zip, zilch. And uh, like him, for many of us, I think the that the chief confirmation of the shortcomings of this world is not going to come from broken things in a garage. It's going to come from broken people. It's going to come from abusers and deceivers and promise breakers. It's going to come from stress and pain and sickness and bereavement. Broken things, broken people, broken hearts. That's the naughty world. 
there are 200-year-old lawnmowers. There are not 200-year-old people. And so every one of us at some point will grieve or be grieved, uh, likely both. So how does Hebrews resolve this conundrum that we have arrived and it is awful? Because this is not very encouraging. Verse 26, think back to Mount Sinai. At that time, God's voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. We have arrived in heaven already, but at the same time, we've not yet completely left the old world behind. It's as if, believers, we have one foot in eternity, and, and yet one foot still in the old world, as if we're kind of on the cusp or in two places at once. Uh, it's much clearer in verse 28, I think, this idea. We are receiving, you could underline that, present active tense, a kingdom that cannot be shaken. It's in process. The end state has begun. And as the end unfolds, everything from the old world will continue to break down. It might even break down more quickly than it used to. Maybe this is why things don't last anymore. And it will be shaken. Everything will be shaken. And it will come to naught because it's a naughty world. From the greatest empire to the very smallest machine. And only that which is fit for eternity will last. So how do we make sure that we are worthy for eternity and are not a Honda? By inter I'm very annoyed with Honda right now. Just out of warranty, isn't it always the way? Uh, by entering through Jesus, verse 24, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood. One is brought in, as always, in the same way as always, through sacrifice. It was a sacrifice in Egypt that led them to Sinai. It was a sacrifice on Sinai that led them to Zion. It was a sacrifice in Zion every single year that kept them in Zion. There were always sacrifices, and now there is another sacrifice but with distinction. This sacrifice uniquely speaks a better word. Better means bigger or, or biggest. There's nothing bigger or better than the blood of Jesus, and nothing more is needed. We know this because verse 23 says, through it, through Jesus, the righteous are made perfect. Uh, the key word here, teteleomenon. It's just fun to say, teteleomenon. Uh, it's past tense. It's a done deal. It's not a process. It is finished. It's passive in mood, meaning it's done to you. You contribute absolutely nothing. It was a gift. And so a much more literal translation of this word would be, you have been completed. You have been brought into your logical ending state by someone else. The coming of the kingdom is a process, but the price of your entry has been paid once and for all already. This explains how we can be completely certain that we have been saved and why daily it feels like we haven't. That's the gospel. But so what? It's not a sermon without the gospel, and it's not a sermon without so what? If you go to something that purports to be a sermon and there's no gospel, there's no so what, that was an after-dinner speech. So I hope the food was good. But it ain't a Christian sermon. Uh, so what? Three very brief implications now. First, don't reject it. Some did in the past. You go back through all those old iterations, Egypt and Sinai and Zion, you're always going to find someone who rejected the grace of God. Don't do that. Don't miss out on the real thing. Verse 25, see that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him, in Egypt and Sinai and Zion, who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. So don't reject him. Second point, say thank you. It's just always nice to say thank you when someone gives you something lovely. 
Just, it's just polite. Just say thank you. Our youths right now are going to be writing thank you cards to every one of you that bought a Belgian block to sponsor the mission trip. And if they can do that for a $25 gift, and by the way, uh, it's technically not a gift. You bought a thing, so you won't be able to get that on your tax return, I'm afraid. Uh, verse 28, if they can say thank you for a cheap deal, uh, can we not be grateful for receiving an eternal and perfect kingdom that cannot be shaken? I think we can say thanks. And I'm going to suggest to you the people most grateful, most able to say thank you to God for this kingdom that cannot be shaken are those of us whose present kingdoms have been shaken to bits right now. Frequently I find as a pastor the people most expectant of eternity are the ones who are most bereaved right now, who've had the worst news this week. Third point, worship. If you've been brought into the perfect kingdom, into the presence of the perfect God, and you know that everything is just going to get better by your death or his return, you're going to get more alive if you die, not less. And the what awaits you is perfect union with God and perfect union with his people that you will be closer to every believer that has ever been than, than you are to the closest person in your life right now. And that if you've lost someone who was dear to you, you will in fact know them more in the next kingdom, not less. And that what awaits you is perfection. Then logically it makes sense that whatever it was that brought you in must have been perfect too. And whatever he did must have been perfect too. And at last, therefore, we have answered the central question of Hebrews. It's taken five months. Who is Jesus? Well, he's perfect, and everything he does is perfect. He is God, and he is worthy of your worship. Unlike all the crumbling things from this old world in which we used to put our trust, time and time again, the things around us have come to naught, and we keep trusting them. That's not worship of Jesus. Do not cling to those things, none of them. All of the consumables in your life will be consumed in the fire. Only that which is eternal shall last. And so people often say to me, what does it mean to worship Jesus? Hebrews says to worship Jesus is to unworship absolutely everything else. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this long story of consistent promise and sacrifice and increasing proximity to you. And that now, Lord Jesus, at the very end of time, we've been brought into the, the edges of eternity uh, fully through your work. And Lord, as, as the old things fade away, would you protect and preserve us, those of us who are in grief or have received difficult news? And Lord, would you give us all that longing for the everlasting home that awaits for us, the true Zion, in Jesus' name? Amen. As uh, young people come in absolutely perfectly on time, I'm going to invite Amelia uh, to come to the front and to bring her family with her. Mrs. Fire, do you want to make sure everyone can sit and see? Thank you. got a very important part of the baptism and that's the towel so Ben's getting that for us um, and if you if you can't see you're welcome to move around with it but of course you can yeah come and sit here that's going to be great you're welcome to do that the candidate for holy baptism will now be presented Present Amelia Jane to receive the sacrament of baptism. Today, on behalf of this child, you shall make vows to renounce the devil and all his works, to trust God wholeheartedly, and to serve him faithfully. 
Are you willing and ready to undertake this? I am the Lord being my helper. <laughs> You've got two things to do. Do you renounce the devil and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God? We renounce, renounce them. Do you renounce the empty promises and deadly deceits of this world which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God? We renounce them. Do you renounce the sinful desires of the flesh that draw you from the love of God? We renounce them. Almighty God, deliver you from the powers of darkness and evil and lead you into the light and obedience of the kingdom of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and confess him as your Lord and Savior? We do. Do you joyfully receive the Christian faith as revealed in the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments? We do. Will you obediently keep God's holy will and commandments and walk in them all the days of your lives? I will, will the Lord, Lord be my helper. I'm going to ask uh, everyone to stand as we make these promises together. Uh, it's a profound promise you're about to make. Uh, and so uh, only say we will if you really mean it. Will you, who witness these vows, do all in your power to support Amelia in her life in Christ? We will. Let us join with Amelia and her sponsors to proclaim our faith in the words of the ancient baptismal confession, the Apostles' Creed. Do you believe and trust in God the Father? I do. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe and trust in Jesus Christ? suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit? She wants to come to me? Yeah. All right. I'll trade you. Uh, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, can you hold that for me? Hi. We're going to try this. Hello. Ooh. Oh, hi. Hi. Amelia, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Christ Amen. claims you for his own. Receive his healing, his forgiveness, and his love and fight valiantly as a soldier of Christ against sin, the world, and the devil. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Okay. In a very child-friendly way, let's welcome the newly baptized. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Do you want to take a back? Sure. Oh, that's great. She's perfect. Oh, wow. Wow. If you need this. Yeah. I think she's pretty good. She likes water. She likes water and she's very absorbent. <laughs> Let's say together, we receive you into the fellowship of the church, confess the faith of Christ crucified, proclaim his resurrection, and share with us in the royal priesthood of all his people. Amen. As we remain standing, uh, let's welcome the newly baptized and exchange a sign of the peace with one another. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. Oh. oh, the announcements are on my desk. Just a couple of announcements. You can all have a seat for a second. Uh, one, Adult Forum will be next week. So uh, I encourage you all to uh, come after the, and stay after the 9 uh, a.m. service uh, to open the word together. Uh, that happens right across the way in the meeting house. There are still collections going on for Shepherd's Heart. If you look, there's information on the boxes out in the lobby there. Uh, I encourage you to Take a look at that, um, and I think it's, are there are collections for Kairos as well, Stu? 
Okay, it's all for Shepherd's Heart. Um, so, the shoe drive, Shepherd's Heart. Yeah, and there's another one. Uh, check, the annou- check the announcements in your email for all of that. Um, and and uh, lastly, uh, today's Memorial Day, uh, or tomorrow is Memorial Day. This is Memorial Sunday. Um, and we just recognize that people have given their lives um, to, to serve others and um, to provide us this safe place to be. Uh, so let's pray and just give thanks for those sacrifices and look forward to the day uh, when God will cause all wars to cease. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you um, for the courage and the bravery and the self-sacrifice um, of those who have given their lives so that we could have freedom and peace and safety. We thank you for that, and we, we know that that is a, just a tiny pointer to the ultimate sacrifice that you made for us. Um, and so when remembering them, we remember you, and we look forward to the day when all swords will be beaten into plowshares, and the lion will lie down with the lamb. These things we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and by his cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's enter into a time of Holy Communion by singing together the doxology as we stand. Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right to give it is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. kneel or be seated. All praise and glory is yours, O God, our Heavenly Father, for in your tender mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. He made there by his one offering of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. And he instituted, and in his holy gospel, commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For on the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he... he, and he, when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And here we offer and present to you, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice. 
We humbly pray that all who partake of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, be filled with your grace and heavenly benediction, and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. a better word than all the empty clays I've heard upon this earth speaks righteousness for me stands in my defense Jesus it's your blood what can wash away our sins what can make us whole Nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash us pure as snow, welcomed as the friends of God? Nothing but your blood, nothing but your blood, King Jesus. cross testifies in grace tells of the father's heart to make a way for us now boldly we approach not earthly confidence it's only by your blood what can wash away our sins what can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash us pure as snow, welcomed as the friends of God? Nothing but your blood, Nothing but your blood, King Jesus. Wow. 
What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to his. Oh, how strange and divine, I can sing all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. The deeds now and ever is my plea. All the chains are released. I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. said that he will bring me home and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne to this I hold my hope is only Jesus all the glory evermore to him when the is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand, in Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless pain. Of love and right. 
righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Amen. Let's pray together the post communion prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Alleluia, alleluia. alleluia. alleluia.